Hello there. Um, thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, my name is Karen Longdon um, and for those of you who don't know me, I work for Food for Life and I'm the National Development Manager for Food for Life Served Here and Green Kitchen Standard. This is actually the second webinar um, that we've run um, in a series where we're trying to offer some support to school she chefs and cooks in this very challenging time. We've got some speakers today. Um, we've got um, Jane Fairbank, who is a school cook from Calderdale. We've got Bill Campbell, who is an education services advisor. And we've got Jeanette Ori joining in a little while. And we've also got Alistair Griffiths, who's our senior awards manager, who works for Food for Life. And what, what we're aiming to do with these webinars is really try and answer your questions and give you some advice um, for any issues that you might be having. We understand that it's a really challenging time. Um, so we have got a function. We've had some questions submitted beforehand, which we will be answering after the speakers. And we've got a function where you can type any questions that you've got in the chat and we will try and pick them up. If we can't give you an answer today, um, we will uh, pick them up at a later date and, uh, and make sure that you get the information that you need. So for now, uh, we're going to start off with um, some information from Alistair Griffiths, who's our senior awards manager. And over the last few weeks, Alistair has been really busy um, with calls from school cooks, head teachers uh, who are really struggling with um, new ways of operating since the schools have gone back. So I'm going to hand over to Alistair now. Um, and then I'll pick up again later. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Um, yeah, so I guess what I'm going to talk through um, is to try and first give a bit of kind of background and understanding from the SLT's point of view, from what I've been, from what I've heard from head teachers um, and teachers about their kind of primary concerns about schools reopening. Um, but then also try and talk you through how, if I was in your position and making that case to the SLT about shifting towards um, a normal dinner service, um, how I would go about it and kind of then leave those points up to you um, later on to kind of ask questions or disagree with me in many ways as well, because I, I recognise I'm not a school cook and so I don't quite have your perspective um, but I do have a classroom perspective from being an ex-teacher and from having um, yes yeah, spoken to um, the senior leadership teams, school business managers and teachers. So the primary concern um, beyond kind of child safety which is always the primary concern of schools is staff absences um, which comes in two kind of a double whammy really because you've got staff that are going off sick because they have COVID symptoms and so we're therefore having to self-isolate until they get a test result or their children are coming home with COVID symptoms um, and having to kind of stay with them until they get a test and that is kind of a big issue for a lot of them and I would say dominating the headspace um, of every teacher or every head teacher that I've spoken to so far um, and is kind of restricting their capacity to really kind of think outside of that um, and they're getting tunnel vision almost in trying to address that um, and then on top of that they've got this whole push to catch children up on the learning that they've missed as well so they're kind of being like the issue of school staffing is them making their job of what they were initially anticipating being the biggest issue was catching those students up in the classroom. Um, so that's just to give a bit of context as to what we need to recognise head teachers are dealing with, but then also not kind of standing by and letting those things be the only issues that they worry themselves with, because we know that school dinners, um, you know, they've been in the news all throughout this. Um, kind of lockdown period and throughout the summer um, and we really need to kind of press hard on really demonstrating the importance of them. Um, 
so I'm going to go through about five points of how to kind of put normal school dinner service back into the mind of um, senior leadership and kind of how to help them like how to take those troubles out of their hands and like kind of help you show that you do know how to run this service and that they can trust and rely upon the expertise that they have within their school to lead on kind of putting this back in place. Um, so it's split into two things and one of them is building a facts base and the other one is kind of building the contextual base of what, why hot school dinners and normal dinner service um, are important. So first of all, what I'll be doing is looking at universal infant free school meals. If you're running a kind of cold lunch service at the moment, interrogate what that free, the universal infant free school meal take up is. Because if you can see that that number is significantly lower than what it usually is, um, the benchmark we'd be looking for is less than 70% because we know that traditionally less than 70% at key stage one for school dinners is quite a low take up. Um, and the reason why we'd be looking at that is from the perspective of a parent, if you've got a packed lunch that is the same option all throughout the week of three different sandwiches, ham, cheese and tuna, and your child only likes cheese sandwiches as an example, you're not going to want them having a cheese sandwich all throughout the week. And so they might only have a cheese sandwich twice a week that is provided through universal and from free school meals, but then they provide something themselves for the other three meals a week. And so then you're seeing that parents are actively choosing to pay for a service that or like to pay for not using your service. Um, and if you can demonstrate that to school leaders that it kind of shows that this school meal service isn't working and isn't serving the need of what your school community is looking for. Um, and that kind of leads into the next point of parent voice. Um, and I think we've like I've heard this like quite a lot um, and also heard the absence of it um, mostly in that parents haven't been asked what they want at all since coming back to schools like no very few schools have gone to parents and asked them what school meal service are you looking for um, and I think as we go into winter um, we know that parents more and more want a hot meal for their children during winter um, and school meals pick up and so this is really a crucial point for schools to go out and ask their parents do they want to return to a hot meal service um, and kind of collect that information from them. Alternatively, you could also ask the kids as well. Um, you know, it's a big part of that whole school approach that we we push as Food for Life it is making sure that everyone is consulted and their voices are heard. Um, and the third thing is from a teacher perspective, when teachers are now in classrooms with like eating lunch with their kids, a lot of them will now be seeing um, what are in those packed lunches coming from home more regularly. Like now each day they're able to see what their, their students and pupils are eating um, and wouldn't be surprised to hear that many of them are shocked. Um, you know, we know that a lot of them are for the first time kind of recognising the starkness of just how regularly um, kids are eating really high sugary um, goods. And so getting that voice from the teachers of what they're seeing to make that case of we need hot dinners back so that we can encourage people away from packed lunches that aren't as good a quality as what we know you guys serve. Um, so the next points are contextual points. They're not things that are necessarily fact based, but I guess kind of appeal to emotion, um, but also just a kind of recognition of how important school dining is and how important free school meals are as well um, in your uh, community. So classroom dining, when you're eating in a classroom, it's very different to a dining hall. And a lot of what we do 
with schools is we know that dining halls also pair up as assembly halls and they also pair up as PE halls as well. And part of what we do is kind of look at how the children can be involved in making it really clear that when they're in there for lunchtime, it is very much a lunchtime hall. And we kind of hear loads of wonderful ways that that's happened. Um, but now that they've gone into classrooms, it's a lot harder to do that in every single classroom, get every single teacher to do it. Um, and what we've heard and what can be expected, certainly from my point of view as a teacher, would be you'll take the easy route and you'll stick on a video um, whilst they're eating, they're sat down at their desks and they're eating, watching a video. And whilst that is good as a treat um, every now and again, if that's going to be happening reliably for an entire term, what you're missing there is the really valuable role that lunch times play um, in the hidden curriculum where children are learning to socialise, they're learning to solve conflicts that occur during lunchtime, they're not talking to each other as much, they're not talking to new people as much, they're not interacting with adults as much either because that's a big part of lunchtime is interacting with adults that aren't teachers and learning to kind of yeah feel out boundaries. Um, second one is food poverty. So we know that a lot of schools, even though they were kind of aware through the numbers um, that they hear of um, kind of poverty in their regions that are often driven by free school meal percentages, like using that number of free school meal percentages. Um, I think what's happened over this is where parents have come to schools for help around getting food and access to food um, outside of school or where the school would usually have provided that through school meals, that's kind of made it really clear to them the need um, that like just the raw need that a lot of these families have for schools to provide that meal. Um, and for me, that's really important because free school meals for a lot of school leaders don't like it becomes a number um, as opposed to the actual why it's been introduced, like that idea that children who are eligible for free school meals need that one nutritious meal every single day um, because they might not be able to be or their families might not be able to provide that for them when they're at home and kind of driving home that point now um, that kind of providing a good nutritious meal reliably um, is more important now than ever and they're aware of that more than now um, than ever so they're kind of the five or six points that I'd be looking at um, to speak to my senior leadership team when I'm broaching the conversation about how do I like we need to go move back to a normal school dinner service um, and I guess a few things that I'd you know like to hear from you um, because we know that a lot of schools are different but we also know there are lots of schools who are managing to move to a hot dinner service. Um, so a few questions I have for you, I suppose, are what are the barriers for moving to a hot dinner service? Um, how widespread is um, kind of being on a cold dinner service or a packed lunch dinner service? Um, and if you know of how other schools have dealt with it or your own schools have dealt with it, um, what do you think was key to solving that issue? Thanks, Ali. Um, that was really interesting. Um, obviously, talking about the importance of um, children having a hot school meal, at least one hot meal a day. Um, and we're hearing from lots of schools where that's just not happening at the moment. But then other schools where there's really good examples, practical examples of how how they're dealing with that and how they're making sure that the children are having a hot meal, even if it's on a reduced menu. 
So um, please do submit any questions. As I said, we do have some questions that were submitted previously um, that we'll, we'll talk about after. There is, uh, I should have told you how to do it actually, which would have been helpful right at the beginning, but there is a, an event Q&A button. So if you find that you can submit <laughs> questions through there and we will pick them up. Um, the next speaker we've got is uh, Jane Fairbank, who's the catering manager at Scout Road Academy um, and leads a team um, absolutely passionate about providing quality meals in Calderdale. Uh, she's a long standing member of the Calderdale Cooks Network. Um, and yeah, we're really pleased that she's just going to talk about the experience that she's had so far in coming back. Waking up, Karen. OK. You're live now, Jane. Hi, I don't know if you can hear me because um, my uh, computer's just froze. Can everybody hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Uh, well, I'll talk anyway. We can hear you, Jane. Hi, um, I don't know if you can hear me because my computer's froze at this end, so I'll just talk anyway in the hope that you can. Um, as Karen said, I've done this job for a long time, um, approximately 39 years, so um, quite a lot of experience in school catering. We're uh, faced with new challenges that we've never really come across before. At the moment, I'm actually catering for three schools. Pre-COVID, we catered for four schools. Um, one of the schools just decided that um, before the summer holidays, when we came back, the five weeks that we had, that they didn't want to entertain hot meals um, and was bringing their own packed lunches. We didn't particularly have any discussion over this um, and they didn't ask for any advice or any follow up. It was just dropped. Um, so sadly, we've lost members of staff through this and people have been made redundant. Um, but the three schools that we have left we're providing a hot meal every day. Uh, it's a reduced menu. They all used to have um, a very um, good choice of a salad bar that they all help themselves to, which obviously that's gone now. Um, but they do get um, a main meat choice, if you like, every day with potatoes and um, two veg. Or if it's a pasta meal, we still make our own main bread. Um, Hello, they, have a, they have a vegetarian choice. Um, so basically how it's working at our school is um, our dining room is back open. It's divided down the middle so we have two bubbles. Um, the non-teaching assistants are now serving the food that we serve up for them on the counter and then they're taking it out to the children so we're not crossing over the bubble. Um, we're not doing hot puddings anymore but it's still all homemade baking or cakes, uh, fruit, yogurt and things like that. The other two schools that we're still catering for, they're still having the hot meals and the same as us, um, baking, flapjack, fruit, yogurt. And from what I can gather, everybody seems quite happy with this because they really, really wanted a hot dinner. They didn't want sandwiches. Um, so although the choice has been reduced, they're still getting a hot homemade meal every day. Um, and it seems to be going quite well. Um, I don't think in the beginning, I think um, the non teaching staff struggled with serving um, the meals because they're not used to it. They don't know the children. There were a couple of little bits of mistakes made with um, we're still having to cater for special diets, um, which we've found ways round of as they've arose. We've found ways to address it so that no mistakes happen. Um, so all seems OK with that, really. Um, my meat supplier last week went down with um, the COVID out outbreak there. So they just closed like that um, and they've reopened now. They had 12 days, I think 14 days, sorry, in quarantine. So we had all that to deal with, um, reordering different food to provide the service that we're doing. But generally people are just sort of going with it and making the best of it. Um, the system that was set up when we came back via the head and the assistant head, we've sort of had to work around a little bit so it worked for both sides of the team, us and them. 
but it all seems to be going quite well now. We've got children at the other schools that have been having to isolate because of parents or been on holidays and we've been sending food for them home, but we've sent it to the appropriate school and it's either been dropped off to the families or um, they've collected it from the school. Um, so if anybody else has any questions that they want to ask or my advice, if I can give it, I'll try. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that, Jane. And um, that was a really good example of um, a, a really practical example of how uh, Jane's coping and how they're still managing to serve a hot meal. Um, yes, yeah, so that, that's really good to hear. And um, the challenges around bubbles uh, it seems to have been overcome there and the children are getting some hot food, which, which is great. Um, yeah, now We've got some technical issues with Bill, so I am going to introduce him and I'm hoping that we can get him on the line. Bill's uh, um, an education services advisor uh, with experience in both private and public sector catering services. Um, for the past six years, he's provided advice to catering providers at all level of education. So I'm really hoping that we can get him on the line um, to talk to you. Uh, we'll see how it goes as ever. Uh, we're having technical issues. Hi. Hello. Hi there, Bill. I can hear you. Can you can you use my landline? It's probably a bit clearer. The O one seven six seven number. I think Bill's just been muted. Um, I think what we'll do while we try to get Bill on the line um, and Jeanette will be arriving shortly as well, um, who's also been having some technical issues. Um, we'll just start looking at some of the questions that we've had submitted beforehand. And please do um, use a live event question and answers as well. Uh, I believe that we've had quite a few people struggling to get on the on the call. Um, through the link and we are recording this so any of the information um, you will be able to access afterwards as well. Uh, so one of the questions we got um, and this was submitted um, a couple of days ago was around how um, schools are coping with children that are self-isolated and uh, having to provide um, weekly food parcels for children, especially when uh, the families might not have um, much room in the fridge or even not have a fridge. So we've been asked, we've been asked for some advice on that. And there, there is some information on the um, Department um, for Education's website around that. Um, but we, we did have some ideas. I'm going to pass back to Ali now, who I know has dealt with this over the over the past week. Um, and yeah, Ali hopefully will have some advice for us. Hi there. Yes, yeah, so this was a question that came in from a school in Derby. It was a like in-house cook who had kind of been told to sort this out by his head teacher um, and not really given any guidance on what he needed to do. Um, but, you know, he, he wanted to do it justice without kind of just throwing in five jacket potatoes and a can of baked beans. Um, so the key part really was looking at the ski school food standards um, and looking at how we could get different um, kind of all of the five food groups in without needing a fridge at all. So everything being kind of store covered ingredients. Um, and I guess for the starchy foods, that's relatively simple you're looking at potatoes pasta rice um possibly wraps as well depending on um kind of what day you're recommending to use it um tinned fruits so long as they're kind of in fruit juice not syrups um are another good option to getting those fruit or tinned vegetables alternatively as well um and yeah kind of having um, yeah, just kind of raw fruit as a pudding in and of itself. Um, but the other key part was trying to link up 
um, what's going in there with actual recipes to to try and encourage the parents to be cooking or like to help them actually cook this or cook these ingredients um, without just expecting them to know what to do with them and kind of just giving them a menu and kind of saying off you go. Um, and so we try to provide them with a set of five different meals. Um, and I'll see if I can find which ones were suggested. Um, yeah, and kind of five simple like and five simple ones that didn't require um, any key ingredients or um, key cooking skills. Um, and that was kind of it. We did also recommend having a look at there was something put together by Jack Monroe as well, um, otherwise known as Tin Can Cook, um, who kind of specialises in cooking with ambient food or stool covered ingredients. Um, yeah, so that was one resource externally we looked at um, and also providing the skill snippet videos for parents um, yeah, who don't have confidence in kind of using knives or but also to encourage their like them to cook with their children as well to kind of use this as an opportunity to cook together and eat together um, as well. I'm afraid I can't find what I sent to Mark in terms of what we recommended but from memory it was various vegetable fritters um, using kind of canned carrots and courgettes um, and trying to look at different vegetables that didn't over a week wouldn't need to be stored in in a fridge anyway. Um, yeah, thanks Karen. Thanks Alan. Um, so some ideas there. Um, from the guidance of, of the Department of Education's website, um, it does give you a list of what you should be providing. Um, but I think one of the things that we, we do, you do need to remember is remember about the allergies. So um, that was one of the things that was pointed out that we um, even with food that's sent home, if that child's got an allergy, that needs to be taken into taken into account. And um, it does all mention also about still providing food that meets the school food standards. And we've had a question about that as well, but I do believe that we've got Bill now, so we're going to try again with Bill and we'll come back to the questions um, once we've heard from him. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Bill. Nice to have you on the line. I'm sorry that there's been some technical problems. All right, it's probably um, yeah, I've already introduced you, so I'm hoping that everybody will be able to hear you. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you now um, to, to just um, chat a little bit. Um, we've already uh, looked at one of the questions that we've had um, beforehand, but we will come back to the others afterwards. So I'll hand over to you now. OK, fine. OK, thank you for that. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Despite the uh, technical difficulties, for those that know me and were relieved at the fact that I probably wasn't going to say anything, I'm sorry, but you're not going to get away with it that easily. Um, essentially, I've been asked to uh, comment on the current situation, really from a, a sort of wider industry perspective, and also my thoughts on on the future and how this is going to actually pan out as as months goes on. But I think. I'd just like to start off by, by, by saying that the one thing I've noticed over the past well, six to seven months is actually how adaptable the in industry has been and the response it had in terms of uh, the, the, the current position and not least the actual flexibility of the catering teams on site uh, because most and many schools have had to stay open through this whole period uh, with staff going in in some cases virtually as normal to provide uh, meals for uh, children of um, frontline workers and also children from vulnerable families. So I think it's sometimes it's a, it's a hidden uh, thought that this industry has actually carried on, whereas many others immediately ground to a halt. And also, I think the, the caring approach that I've noticed that a lot of uh, the frontline staff have actually given in terms of supporting the schools through this process. Um, I think the one thing that comes up out of this is really the key concerns 
uh, not so much the difficulties around providing a service at the moment, which I have to say from a national point of view, um, it varies from schools not providing meals at all to those actually going back as business as normal. And if I was on the screen and you could see me, I'd love to gauge a straw poll in terms of um, how that has been affected in terms of are things back to normal uh, as a school sees it? Are they taking any, apart from any uh, normal um, distancing procedures or have they taken um, extreme uh, sort of measures and not provided a meal at all? But not that with that standing, I think this obviously gives out um, a number of issues that we're more than happy to be aware of. Because I see from the, the list of people that have actually uh, logged into this, that um, there are a mixture of local authorities, uh, companies and in-house services as well. And I think the one thing that worries the industry is the sustainability of the whole service, both from a financial aspect, which then uh, reflects in terms of how does that deliver the service for the future and all the work that's gone on and with obesity strategies and with the food standards in schools is that going to at all become affected. I think numbers is the initial cause and I think from what I've seen in schools around the country um, with the changes that a lot of schools have made to break times and various other aspects the numbers in some cases are fairly reasonable um, but I'd be interested to gauge what people think in terms of how many meals they're actually doing now as they were um, back in February or March. The other aspect, as I said, is, is the overall financial sustainability of it, because this is going to affect companies that provide contracted services as it does from those services within local authority uh, basis. Although my suspicion is that local authorities in, in some areas may well be better placed to continue the support to the meal service as opposed to some of the contracting companies. I think the actual minimum number of meals that are used to actually break even is probably going to increase, which is probably the, the, the main aspect. So I've rambled on a little bit about these sort of things, but I think from the, the future, uh, of the service from my aspect, it's, it's an ongoing change process. I think back in March, everyone was hoping that it'll all be done and dusted by June or July, but here we are in September now, and it's probably gonna go on for at least another six months to a year. Um, certainly until some kind of vaccine is found and people have a little bit more confidence in terms of uh, the social, social, social meeting aspect. But I think one thing that's going to have a longer effect on this whole thing is people's approach to um, social distance and also their own sort of consciousness in terms of meeting in large groups. So from a catering point of view, I think certainly dining rooms and that a lot of schools have already got challenges in terms of space um, where children are meeting, uh, they're having to have different sittings. And I think um, unless there's a, a sort of more longer term approach in improving um, break times and the actual space available, having dedicated dining rooms in smaller schools, um, I can't see the, the, the situation changing greatly. But at the moment, I think in terms of starting back in September, um, schools have made great strides in terms of uh, adapting their own working environment and educational environment uh, to making this work for the catering service. But the main thing from my point is to keep the profile high of the service, keep the backing of the parents in terms of the importance that's given to the hot meals um, and just keep, keep working on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, if there's any questions that come through, I'd be happy to try and take those if I can offer that. But uh, as a phone in, it's a very much a one-way uh, one communication. Is that okay, Karen? That's great. Thanks, Bill. We could hear you really well there. Thank you for that. And what I'll do is we'll keep you on the line. We have got some questions coming through, so we'll we'll start off with the questions now. And when we know that Jeanette's um, ready to join, and okay. um, I'll get a nod for that as well. So um, we have had a question through around um, on the live question answer around um, the challenges of not having enough space in the lunch hall to have each year group. 
and um, and that they're having to you know have each year, year group eating separately and um, they'd love to hear how other schools are managing this and I know Alistair's put some information on the chat as well about putting in touch um, and um, as a chair of a, a chair of governors at a local school we have this issue in our school and the way that we the way that the head teacher um, at my school looked at it was they have um, uh, different sittings so they have two sittings mm -hmm. now in the dining hall and they bring in different year groups um, and they swap it around week by week and then they have some children eating in the classroom which isn't ideal but but that's how they've done it I think yeah. I'm, I'm just going to go to Jane I think to see if Jane's got any advice on what they're doing in their school as well we we are actually we are actually eating in our dining room and um, originally before we came back they said the children would be eating in the classrooms and we was um, boxing it all up on trolleys and it was going to the classrooms but then they came up with the idea of sort of splitting the dining room so we've got um, um, shields would you call them stood up in the dining room to separate it into two bubbles our tables are the long tables with the buffets on the side that fold up and fold down so we've got um, room for 32 lots of 32 we're not full up because there's children still off there's children that's been off with cold so we bring the first lot in and they sit down they're not allowed to move once they've sat down and um, the non-teaching assistants take everything to them and clean it away so they have their seat they are all next to each other but that's their seat and then the next lot come in and they sit down so there is two lots in at the time and they've just got a screen between them but they have their own bubbles serving them and then when they finish these servers clear the trays away as well um, and then they go out in the separate bubble and the other bubble follows on the dining room's clean then um, by actually a member of the kitchen staff because the non-teaching assistants take the children out we have one member that goes in and cleans all the dining room with the sanitizer and what have you before the second lot come in so in some ways it's more or less as it was before we had two sittings before um, but they sort of sat where they wanted so they are sitting in their own groups their own classes and they move one class at a time and they come in one class at a time and they go into a separate play play area and then the next lot um, as I say teaching assistants are serving them from we serve it at the counter they come take it away and we're not coming into contact with those children now um, so and it does seem to be working um, and I know that's some of the schools the other schools that we're sending out to they have got children in the dining room but they've also got two classrooms that children are eating from um, and there seems to be working as well but they're all hot meals no sandwiches don't know if that helps. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Jane. And again, another practical example there of how how one school um, are coping with uh, what they've got to do. Uh, it is and we know that it's really difficult, but um, we've had lots of questions in the past about the challenges of actually transporting hot food from the kitchen to classrooms and a classroom environment's not the ideal place for children to be eating. Um, and one of the other questions that we've had uh, is around whether schools are seeing the current status of pack lunches um, as a short or long term service. And it was pointed out that um, schools might take the pack lunch option because they find that they, that's an easier option for them in terms of how they manage lunch times. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm going to hand over to I think Bill's still on the line, so I'm going to hand over to Bill to see if he's uh, got any thoughts on whether or not um, people will be moving to hot lunches from pat lunches, if he's got any experience of that. Um, certainly moving from uh, pat lunches to hot lunches. I mean, I'd probably be encouraging everybody to be providing hot meals as soon as possible um, and, and letting parents know. Obviously, it's down to the school at the end of the day and what they can cope with. Um, a lot of people have started providing hot meals, albeit even hot handheld. Um, my other 
question to it out there if somebody wants to know I'm, I'm keen to see whether people are using the actual um, plates and knives and forks or whether they're having to move to disposable because I'm seeing particularly in secondary schools very few are actually using plates and they're actually moving to dis disposables but in terms of uh, moving to hot lunches I would be encouraging them to do that as soon as possible um, mainly from a from a business point of view once you move them to packed lunches the, the thought then goes into the parents, well, we could be doing that at home and we're actually eroding away the, 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 the true service we're start trying to provide. Thanks, Bill. Karen, could I jump, like Bill, I've also heard, um, yeah, that some schools they've been kind of submitting to us what they've been doing around plates and whatnot. And yeah, like primary schools, are doing that as well it's not just in secondary schools where using um yeah disposable um not just kind of bowls or kind of pack ups but also disposable cutlery as well um okay thank you thanks and um i was just going to ask jane as well jane are you using um plates I think you did say that you're using plates and everything has disposable crockery been mentioned to you or is it not something that you No, because we looked at all the choices that we had in the beginning mainly without being offensive because of the teaching staff because um, they didn't want to get involved with hot meals and one thing or another um, I must admit we have had a little bit of a backward movement but it's working and they're still getting a hot meal we've actually gone back to the plastic flight trays to help the teaching staff because there's less mess because it's all on the flight trays um, and everything goes on to this one tray that they just have to pass out because we've got the new little ones as well who normally need quite a lot of help early days with cutting food that's all of the table all of the floor and the teachers didn't want this happening in the classroom because they tried it before the holidays and they really didn't like the mess and the food in there and the smell of the food in there so i think that's why it got changed back to us in the dining room um, so yes it's a compromise and a backward step but they're still getting a hot meal it's all on one tray it's easier for the non-teaching staff to serve we just put everything on and they eat off it and then it's cleared away but I'd rather do that than disposables packed lunches and well there's the cost and then there's the environment waste and you know it all puts your cost up which as you say, when numbers are less anyway, we're fighting against that all the time. So um, the other schools are actually doing the same, but it is working. And if it gets them a hot lunch and we're not spending a lot of money on disposables, well, it's better than nothing. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jane. That's really great. Um, yeah, you've just mentioned about school meal numbers dropping and we have been um, talking to uh, the Food for Life Served Here licensees, school caterers over the last uh, couple of weeks and the sort of information that we're getting back from them is that there seems to be a trend of around 30 to 40 percent of a drop in meal numbers. Um, but interestingly, in one area or two areas now actually that we've heard from, the ones that are um, serving hot food um, and have made um, sort of a stand up with head teachers saying, no, we'd really like to serve hot food and make it work. And um, the, the meal numbers in that in those areas have actually risen. So they're actually seeing an increase on what they had before um, through serving hot food. So um, it's just interesting, but the, the trend seems to be as um, it was in Scotland uh, around a 30 percent drop. And um, from colleagues in Scotland, when we've spoken to those, um, although there was a sort of a 30%, 30 to 40% drop straight away in numbers, and um, they've just had their, their first sort of holiday up there, their break, and they're expecting after the break, all the caterers will be going back to serving hot food, and they're expecting numbers to bounce back quite quickly. So I guess that, um, you know, uh, to get numbers back, then um, we really need to be looking at pushing the hot food service. But yeah, so we've got a couple of other questions that came in and they are quite um, closely um, sort of linked. 
and um, it's around concerns about covering kitchens and around um, having the staff to cover kitchens normally. Uh, one of the questions was around um, being able to bring um, different staff into different schools when staff from that school go off um, either to self isolate before they get a test or if they've gone off sick. And then the other one is around um, how other schools are dealing with um, a reduction in staff um, because staff are having to self isolate uh, and whether or not anybody's having to close kitchens and not provide meals. And um, we've had this from from quite a few people, quite a few caterers that are really worried about this. Uh, and one of the solutions that some of the caterers are looking at is having a production hub to make the meals and transport them. Uh, and we have heard from a couple of um, schools that have had to close kitchens and just provide pat lunches for um, for the free school meal children. So it, it is it is concerning and I'm going to pass over to Jane now because I know Jane and they've talked about this within their service. And um, so Jane will give a little bit of information about how they're dealing with it. Hi, um, we've had we've had the hi, we've had the discussion with um, our head and our business manager because um, we're on reduced staff here because of losing one of the schools. We lost a member of staff as well who got made redundant. Um, another girl, there's myself in my kitchen and my assistant cook and with one lady that only works three hours. So the plan is if not not COVID related, but if I went off sick, hopefully, well, we've had the discussion that the other lady would up her hour with my assistant cook and hopefully we, hopefully we would still manage. If it was COVID related, they've already decided because that would be all the staff it would affect. We would have to go on to pack lunches while we isolated and came back. Um, but we also discussed if it's myself or Mandy or the main cooks just for over illness. We've got a menu in place, which is a even more reduced menu and an emergency menu that we will put into place. But at least they will still all get a hot lunch. Um, and we've we've done this menu. We've prepared. We've got stocking ready. It's nothing math fancy, but it, it will work and we'll be able to manage it. Um, so that's what we've put in place here. Um, and, you know, we just have to see how it went, really. Sorry, I'll just unmute myself. That <laughs> um, that's brilliant. Thanks, Jane. And um, I'm just going to pass back over to Bill to see if he's got anything that he wants to add to that and um, for anything that he's heard. <clears throat> well, no, really. I think what, what was just said was, was, was quite correct. Um, I think the only thing I, I think in terms of um, as I go back to the, the future of the service is that essentially we will get through this. I think it's trying to keep the service as live as possible to keep the profile as high as possible and particularly the importance uh, that the service plays uh, not just in school life to the, to the pupils themselves but also the, the service it provides to parents. My, from a my advisor's point of view, clearly the, the one thing that always sticks close to my mind is the financial sustainability of it, um, because as prices go up, uh, there's going to be a point at which either schools can't afford to keep the service or parents can't afford the service. And I think there's going to have to be some support somewhere along the line to make this service more. So from position within uh, public bodies, uh, that have access to government, it's going to be putting pressure on the government to ensure that there's funding available for this service and that it's going to be in some ways protected, not not for the next few months, but for the next couple of years, uh, particularly until we can recover from it and uh, make sure the quality of the food gets back to the sort of thing we were providing before. Um, the other advice I would give is please embrace technology. Um, conscious, as we've seen today, that if you live in certain parts of the country, uh, you, don't, you still don't quite have the infrastructure that a lot of the technology can provide. But there are things in progress at the moment, and this is adapting all the time in terms of not just payment systems, but food service systems in terms of the way meals are produced. 
Now, whether we go back to some form of central production, I don't know, because the quality of that has improved greatly over the years. But I think an open mind needs to be had. And certainly, I, I think ways in which we can maintain the level of food into the schools, as opposed to worrying about the practicalities on a day to day basis, has become part of this new normal. And as I said earlier, I can't see this going uh, any time soon, certainly and not until some kind of vaccination is, is available. So I think we could be with something like this for at least the next year or two. Thanks, Bill. That's really, really useful advice. Bit um, depressing, sorry, but probably useful. It's, but there we are. It is, it is. It's a very challenging time. Um, one of the things that um, when I took advice on this question uh, this morning, one of the sort of points that was made was that each school now has their own um, COVID risk assessment. So really, uh, when we talk about bringing different staff in, um, they will have they will have thought of that because they will have thought of it in terms of their own staff um, and how they are going to deal with um, their own staff going off sick and bringing in supply staff. That's something that they've been asked to think about. So they will all have their own risk assessment and that should cover the staff that come into the kitchen. Unless the school sees um, the kitchen staff as outside staff, and then that changes it again because most schools have got a policy of not letting um, not encouraging sort of outside people into school. So it's always worth um, if you are in that situation, it's always worth checking um, with the school to see what their what their risk assessment is and what their policy is, because that will determine whether or not you can bring in um, another cook um, into the into that bubble, if you will. So that's one thing to think about. Um, and again, um, you've got to really think about the safety uh, of your own staff as well. So um, uh, hopefully everybody's thought about that and you've got your own risk assessments around um, how your staff are working and what they're doing. And obviously that will change if you're moving staff from school to school. Um, yes, yeah, so that's that's something to think about as well. And in the worst case, um, as Jane said, there there's they have thought about this and what they would do. In the worst case, the kitchen would actually shut, um, and um, you would be providing the school would have to provide just a service for the preschool meal children. But um, that would hopefully just be in the worst case scenario. So yeah, so Ali, I don't know whether you've got anything to add on that. Uh, no, not really. I don't. I'm not sure. I'm kind of best place to, yeah, answer on staffing in kitchens. Thank you. I just thought I'd. Um, I just thought I'd make sure I don't want to leave anybody out. Um, please do carry on putting your questions through. Uh, we've had. Um, I know there's a lot of worries out there about uh, meal uptake. Um, we've had um, a, a comment about. Uh, people being worried for their jobs because meal numbers are so low um, and I can't offer specific advice on on jobs. But I think um, what we are hearing is uh, from our point of view that if if a hot meal service is in place, then numbers are higher. Um, as Bill said before, when uh, you know, when you start serving sandwiches to children um, it's it's easy for parents to think that they can do that uh, in a cheaper way. Um, so yeah, the, the one of the other questions that we've had as well is uh, how are cooks meeting the school food standards? Um, if well, from all from all angles, really, if you've got a reduced hot menu, if you're serving food in the classroom, if you're serving a packed lunch, how are other cooks meeting the school food standards? And we've got a lot of reports around um, cooks or are, are trying to sort of stick to the school food standards within their service and getting some pressure from head teachers who maybe think that when it's a when it's a pat lunch, it's not meeting. Uh, they don't think there's enough food there or they're asking where are the crisps? Where are the where are the sort of biscuits and everything? We're getting we're getting a lot of comments like that. Um, and I wondered, uh, Jay, how how are you dealing with that at the moment? Uh, well, we have reduced the menu and um, 
before when the, a lot of our children at this particular school, not my other schools, um, they actually had a preference of the salad bar that they could take anything they wanted. They could take the potatoes, the veg and the salad if they wanted. But the majority of children here did favour the salad bar. Um, but we're just not able to do that because of how it is, because they used to choose what they wanted themselves. Um, and I have realised um, we, we do, when I make things, we make most of our meals are homemade um, and we do try and incorporate veg into like the bolognese sauces or the pasta sauce or things like that. So we are sort of still basically meeting the school full standards. It might not look it on paper, but we have all um, little captions and it's starred and it says at the side where this star is, this includes extra veg or it's been added in. So parents do know that that where it falls down really is the puddings because you cannot get half fruit into a biscuit or flapjack or um, cake. Some, some cakes we do put fruit in because we'll blend it and it goes into the cake, but you can't get it into this. We do put fruit in flapjack with, you know, we'll put apricots in, we'll put sultanas in, but it's not as easy as doing the hot puddings that you could put in, but we still have uh, fruit available and fruit does go out to chop up and serve with the biscuits. Um, so all we can do really is try our best to try and keep as near as we possibly can to the standards. But, um, you know, it's, well, it's impossible really. So we're just trying our best to do, keep making it ourselves, keep producing it ourselves and trying other ways to make sure that they are getting the fruit and they are getting the veg because that's all we can do really. Thanks, Jane. That's that's the real that's really helpful. And um, Bill, have you got anything to add on that? Uh, no, not at all. Other than what I started off by saying, in, in, in that I think the industry has done an amazing job in, in adapting to this crisis and particularly to the needs of schools. And uh, my sort of thoughts go out to all the staff that have actually maintained the services over the past six months. Um, it just shows that actually it's quite unique in in terms of the way it, it does adapt. I also do a lot of work with business and industry and events. And when you see how it's decimated certain aspects of the industry, um, they certainly um, hold uh, catering and hospitality in, uh, in, in, in a high regard. So no, many thanks. Thank you, that's great. Um, as um, Food for Life and Food for Life served here, we do, uh, part of our standards is around meeting the school food standards and we, we know we're hearing that that's really difficult at the moment um, and we do want to hear your thoughts on that uh, as to as to what you know whether that's um, difficult for everybody whether it's uh, you know how how other um, schools school cooks and caterers are are dealing with that and and the feedback that you're getting from head teachers as well if you have tried to meet the school food standards and that's been questioned um, we've had quite a lot of uh, feedback that when um, school's been taken to, uh, food's been taken to the classrooms, um, the head teachers are worried about carpets in the classroom, so they're asking for nothing runny, so it rules out things like soups and gravies and custards and things like that. They're asking for um, really sort of dry food, if you will, and, and that's a real issue when, when you're looking at something like the school food standards. Um, yeah, so hopefully we've got Jeanette Ori joining us very, very shortly. I'm just going to wait for the nod um, to say that she's she's on the line. And um, so Jeanette's going to come and um, give us um, a little bit about her experience and what she's been hearing over the last few weeks. And she'll touch on these questions as well. Uh, but yeah, we've had um, I think we've had two questions through on the live question and answer. So please, and um, we want to make this as supportive as possible for you. So if you do have any comments or questions, please do put them on there and we will pick them up. And um, we are planning as Food for Life to sort of make these webinars um, a regular thing um, so that we can, uh, we feel like it's the best way to, to hear from you and answer your questions. So if there's anything that you think, um, on the next one you'd really like us to talk about, then please do get in touch and let us know about that. And um, we're thinking about doing it monthly so that people can sort of drop in and out of them as they find useful. Um, and uh, 
obviously a uh, food for life the, these webinars and um, we, we want people to join there won't be any charge for them and we want to cover the topics that you're interested in so again please do let us know yeah i'm just waiting for to see if we've got jeanette yeah we're just calling jeanette now so hopefully she's going to hi there jeanette can you hear Hello. me hi jeanette can yes. you hear me? Brilliant. We're so pleased that um, we've got you on the line and we're just sorry that we can't see your lovely face. <laughs> um, <laughs> so for those of you that don't know Jeanette, um, Jeanette's, um, I'm sure that you all know who she is, but I'm going to do the blurb anyway, just for an introduction. But she's a former school dinner lady and lots of practical experience of providing good food, school food. She's the co-founder of Food for Life and we're all really proud of her. Um, she can offer first hand sort of practical advice on uh, on school food. Uh, she's co-chair of the um, School Food Plan Alliance and um, we're also very proud that in the last week she's won um, a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Public Sector Catering Awards. So um, we're, we're all really pleased about that. So Jeanette's going to talk us through um, her experiences over the last few weeks and what she's been hearing and um, Hopefully she'll cover some of the topics that we've had from the questions that have come in as well. And please, if you've got any questions, feel free to put them on there. I know I keep saying it, but um, yeah, do feel free to put them on there. So I'm going to hand over to Jeanette now. Thank you, Jeanette. OK, um, I'm at, hi, everybody. Um, I'm sorry I can't join you. We've just um, it's just been really, really difficult. I've just been on a, 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 another Zoom call, actually, um, the, the later one. And um, I've just been listening to Jane Jones, who is absolutely fantastic, uh, from Scotland, unfortunately. And um, Judith Gregory, who's from Cardiff. And then um, Jackie Manta, who's from Leicester. And they've been giving an overall of, of what's happening. Uh, Jane Jones is, is the chair of um, ASSIST, what is at the equivalent of LACER. And um, so I'm just going to give you a very, very quick overview. So they, Scotland have been back about six to seven weeks. Um, it's obviously everything is changing literally daily. Um, and that's, you know, not just what um, Boris has to say. Uptake is down um, in some areas as much as 30%. Um, in other areas, 50%. Um, in Jane's area, 13%. The, the supply chain has been absolutely critical. Um, both the national suppliers have been really good, but obviously because they bought in, they're looking at short dated stock. So watch, your, watch what comes in is, a, is a, something that I will say to you. The local suppliers um, have been absolutely superstars, Jane says. Um, and they, they have, in actual fact, helped uh, uptake because they are serving good quality, which is hugely important. Um, but, of course, then we've got uh, the free school meal children. More, obviously, more and more because more and more people are losing their jobs. Um, and Jane put it really, really distinctly, saying if you've got a, a secondary school of 400, uh, sorry, 1,400 children, 200, of, it's quite shocking actually, 200 of those children will be living in poverty. And, and I think that's, um, I, I'm going to get some more information on that. So it's really, really important for you guys to get the messaging into schools um, of what you're doing. Some head teachers, as we all know, are very positively um, about uh, hot lunches, others are positively promoting packed lunches or, in, especially in secondaries, obviously, asking pupils to leave sites, um, which is, is not good. Um, we've also got to be realistic, so don't please try and do too much um, because, as I say, we've got to be realistic what we can achieve. The pinch point um, that Jane spoke about was actually the pot washing. So you guys can tell me if this is true or not. Uh, a lot of schools are using disposables, but of course that has got its own issues, the cost, the waste, 
etc., etc. Um, in-class dining. Now, Jane was saying a lot of their schools have done this in-class dining. Um, it's been going around for years, but they've decided to do it. And in certain schools, it's proved really positive because the teachers are saying the children don't have to rush. Um, it's a lot easier. The, the teachers are actually sitting with the students, with the children. Um, and, yeah, it's been, it's been really good. They've had pre-ordering, which again, that's proved very positive. Um, but parents remain quite fearful. Um, and that's why the numbers are down, because they're sending in the... We seem to have lost Jeanette there, which is unfortunate because she was in uh, full throw. Um, I'm sure Taylor um, of uh, support will be trying to get her back on the phone. Um, so yeah, hopefully we'll have Jeanette back very soon and she'll pick up where she left off. But I just thought that that was a really um, interesting perspective on in-class dining um, about it being a positive experience for the children. Um, and I know that in-class dining has brought its challenges for a lot of caterers with how to get the food to the classroom. So I'd be really interested to hear your, you know, what you're actually doing about that. So if you could put that in the chat or in the Q&A, that would be brilliant um, so that we can find out what you're actually doing about. Oh, hi, Jeanette, we lost you then. I know, it just went dead. I don't know what happened. Yeah, well, you're okay, back. Um, back there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, she, Jane did mention the catering staff, I'll just finish this off, did mention the catering staff um, as she she always does and she said she couldn't have done it without, we, you couldn't have done it without them. Judith Gregory from um, Cardiff, again numbers, uptake is down 30%, um, both free and, free and paid. Um, parents want to do their own lunches. Um, 37% increase in free school meals since January this year. Uh, we've got the highest poverty in the UK, actually, um, in, in Wales. Leicestershire, um, they've, she was saying, uh, Jackie was saying, tight control of hours. Um, there's, there's a hold on vacancies at the moment, um, because bearing in mind that Leicester obviously are in local lockdown. Meal numbers, again, are, are slow, so those of you that are in-house, it's to be expected. Um, you know, there's nothing you can do about it at the moment. So paid meals are down, but what, um, interesting, what I thought Jackie was saying was cash is an issue. So um, people don't like handling money at the moment. Uh, they've stopped the movement um, of their managers and the schools are basically saying that they don't want anybody in. Uh, that doesn't need to be um, and then we were looking at obviously the furlough scheme which is due to end in October now the people that were on the call said um, that 66 percent don't have furloughed staff so basically that's a very very quick overview now I know looking at these questions that um, one question was Concerns we have is covering kitchens. Have you done that, Karen? Hi, Jeanette. We we have touched on it, yeah, but it would be really good for um, for you to give your opinion on that. We we talked about um, risk assessments and things like that and having to shut kitchens, but it'd be really yeah. good if you could come in and and just sort of answer it as well. Okay. So um, I actually cheated. Um, I, I got it in my head what I would do or what I would do if I was still in the kitchen. But I actually asked this question um, on this previous call. And so what they said was, um, and this is from a client officer, that they would obviously, um, the staff who were tested positive would be um, isolated, self-isolated at home for the required time. They would then do risk assessment uh, within the kitchen. They would also do a deep clean. And once that deep clean is done, everything's signed off, 
then they would have the staffing as normal. So does that answer that question? It does, yes, thank you, Jeanette. And one of the okay. questions that we got in, um, I know you've seen the ones that we got sent previously, one of the questions that we got in, and um, we did get the other uh, speakers view on this as well, is around um, barrier of not having enough space in the lunch hall to have each year group eat separately. Um, and, and that's a barrier to having a hot meal service. I just wondered if you've got any advice on that or if you'd heard anything where schools are, you know, actively encouraging classes into the lunch hall. OK, um, I think the, the, the lunch hall is, is very difficult. There has to be um, at least, it, what did Boris say, one, one metre plus. Um, so you've got to have a very big hall to get um, two or three year groups in. Um, and so we go back to the in-class dining um, and whether that is something that you can, uh, you guys can speak to your head teacher about. Um, can it work? Will it work? I know of one school that um, has got 16 bubbles um, and they are delivering to obviously 16 classrooms uh, and it's really, really working. Uh, apart from sometimes the teachers can't add up. Um, but apart from that, it's, as I say, it is, it's really going well. So does that help? Yeah, it does. Thank you, Jeanette. And I'll just put a perspective from the school as well. Um, we've been hearing from head teachers about the amount of staff that they've got off um, and having to isolate and the problems that they're having with getting um, testing. Uh, and if schools have a really reduced um, staff number, then eating in the classrooms might provide prove to be difficult because the teachers have to have a break at some point. So I know um, quite a lot of schools have given pushback on that um, in, in actually staffing lunch times. It can be a challenge. So I think it's always good to um, to talk about that with um, with the senior leadership within the team uh, within the school. Um, and Jeanette, I know it's our favourite subject at the moment, or maybe not, but um, we've had questions about school food standards and meeting school food standards um, when there's a reduced service or, or maybe a plat lunch service. And um, I know Jane from uh, Calderdale gave a really sort of some really good advice on what they're doing. Um, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about school food standards at the moment and what your experience is. OK, um, again, this this not through me, this came up um, at this previous meeting. And as Jane said, it is very, very difficult um, to meet the standards without doing a hot meal uh, and a full full menu. And so I think um, that many, many schools will be looking at can we virtually meet it? Because to do a pat lunch is very, very difficult, hugely difficult. But nobody but nobody, I'm afraid, um, and that includes me, will say don't meet the standards because those standards are in law and they're legislative. We are living in, as you are all aware, very, very challenging times and it's changing daily and in some cases hourly and we yesterday we have all got these um, new rules uh, for want of a better word that we have to live by and when you've got four million children living in poverty and 1.7 million children um, on free school meals and rising exponentially, then food, any food, good food, is better than no food. And so you can look on um, either the LACER website, I don't know whether Karen, I'm sorry if I'm repeating what you've said, but there has been some guidance um, that's been prepared by LACER, by Public Health and DOV, and that sets out uh, basically just some principles um, for putting together both a food parcel 
but also it talks about um, the um, hot food as well. So there is two lots. The other, the other um, piece that you can download um, is providing school meals during COVID-19. And this was updated on the 10th of September. So if you Google providing school meals during the COVID-19, it will give you all the information that you need. Um, not just on meals, but on water, um, all sorts of different things. On universal infant, um, on the summer food funds, school food contracts, eligibility and support for families. It will give you a load of information. It's five pages. I've printed it off this morning. So have a look at that. Um, as I say, you can't, you can't, in all honesty, um, and I'm being honest here, you can't meet the standards, but you've got to get as near as damn it. Thanks, Jeanette. Um, and I'll just say that those uh, those links that Jeanette has just mentioned, we'll make sure that they're on our website as well on the Food for Life uh, website so that you can click through from there in case anybody has any any problems finding them. Um, I think we're nearly at an end now, but I'm going to put Jeanette on the spot a little bit because one of the questions we got was around um, uh, providing food for people that are isolating, but using ambient food and tinned food wherever possible. Um, so what would be your advice, Jeanette? What would, what would be a good recipe for um, providing food at home that wasn't didn't have to go in the refrigerator again what i've given you is um when i gave you the guidance that's been prepared jointly if you go on there there's an example parcel and it's for one child for five days and basically it is a loaf of bread or a pack of rolls or 10 inch wraps two baking potatoes a cucumber three large tomatoes one standard tin of sweet corn, five portions of fresh fruit, e.g. apples, saxumas, bananas, or three portions of fresh, and one tin of fruit in juice. Two items from the following. So um, it's got sliced cooked meat, chicken ham, da da da. But it's also got tinned meat, tinned tuna in water, or six eggs. And then um, 200 gram block of cheese, a tin of baked beans, uh, plain yogurt, and two pints of semi-skim milk. And that is for a week. Has that covered it? Yeah, thank you, Jeanette. Um, yeah, so I think, I think we'll probably bring it to an end now. We haven't had any other questions on the live chat, so I'm hoping that that's because we covered everything, not because um, you're not sure how to ask the questions. Uh, I just want to say thank you to all of our speakers and um, once again apologise for the technical issues that we've had that have meant that we can't bring all everybody's videos. Um, but I think we've managed pretty well. So thank you to Taylor who's our, who's been our support for this webinar and thank you to um, all the speakers. If you do have any questions, please, please do uh, let us know. Um, contact us either email or give us a ring. Um, the details are on the screen. We've recorded this webinar, so it will be available to listen back to. And as I said, we are planning on repeating these. Um, so if you've got anything that you think you would like us to cover, again, do do get in touch and we'll do our best. We just want to um, provide a platform that's supportive um, and that gets you the sort of advice that you need. So yeah, so um, we're going to finish now. Um, so yeah, thank you for dialing in and we hope uh, to see you all very soon. Thank you. Thank you.